there is a good time to have carbohydrates and there is a bad time to have carbohydrates. And it's not just about, oh, is it better in the morning versus is it better in the evening? No, it could really depend and all has to do with some pretty crazy cool stuff that we're gonna talk about. But in order for this to all make sense, I have to be my normal kind of nerdy self and I have to get into uh, how glucose actually gets into a cell. So bear with me as I explain this because I truly believe that with education comes adherence. And if you understand the mechanism here, it allows you to apply it much better. So let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, I wish it was as simple as glucose floats through a bloodstream and then just absorbs into a cell, right? I wish it was that simple. But glucose, due to its sheer size and what's called the polar nature, it, it simply cannot just enter into a cell. It doesn't just morph into a cell. Okay, it requires transporters, and there are a number of different transporters that grab glucose out of the bloodstream and put it into a cell. Now, there are what are called sodium-linked glucose transporters, which we're not gonna focus on today, and there are what are called facilitated diffusion glucose transporters, and these are the ones we're gonna focus on, predominantly on GLUT4. Okay, now these facilitated diffusion, what this looks like is you have uh, GLUT1. GLUT1 is a transporter that normally brings glucose into the brain. Okay, GLUT2 is a glucose transporter that specializes in bringing glucose into the pancreas. Okay, GLUT3 is a glucose transporter that specializes in bringing glucose into like neuronal cells. And our friend, the one that we're talking about today, is GLUT4. Okay, now this GLUT4 specializes in bringing glucose into a cell in the muscle. Okay, and it is what is called insulin responsive. So almost everything I talk about on this channel as far as carbohydrate utilization, we're almost always referencing GLUT4 because this is the glucose transporter that brings the majority of glucose into our largest storage area for glucose, which is our muscles. Okay, so the more glucose we can get out of the bloodstream and into the muscle, the better effect we have. The less glucose spike we have, the less risk of it kicking us out of a low carb diet, things like that. So GLUT4 is critical for glucose to get into a cell. It is responsive to insulin. So insulin goes to a cell and it hits the insulin receptor and that tells GLUT4 to go from the center of the cell to the outside of a cell where it catches glucose and brings it in. Well, believe it or not, it isn't just insulin that allows GLUT4 to catch glucose. The mere act of movement and exercise actually allows this GLUT4 to grab glucose too, in a completely independent fashion, separate and apart from insulin. So imagine being able to get glucose into the cell without having to spike insulin. Pretty cool. As a matter of fact, exercise is actually the most potent stimulus for GLUT4 translocation, even more potent than insulin. So exercising and moving the body actually grabs more glucose out of the bloodstream than insulin does. So under resting conditions, when you're not moving your body, your muscle cells are dependent on insulin to get that glucose out of the bloodstream where it really doesn't need to be and into the cell. But under movement, this all changes. You see, when we're exercising, we have changes in energy demand, okay? So when our energy demand changes, like ATP, adenosine triphosphate, our main energy currency, when ATP drops because we're using our fuel, that sends a very special signal. And this special signal does a couple of things. It basically signals through a wraparound way, which I'll explain in a second, to allow GLUT4 to start catching glucose because it's almost an emergency mechanism, okay? It's like all of a sudden the body's using energy so the cells are saying, uh, we don't have insulin present, but oh crud, we need energy. So sound the alarms, let's go ahead and let GLUT4 come to the surface so it can start grabbing glucose because this guy's not eating, there's no insulin, so let's go ahead and pull it in. Okay. But then another interesting thing happens. While we are moving, while we have exercise, okay, exercise is going to increase blood flow. Now I want you to think of this almost like irrigation. Okay, it's like someone turned on the irrigation valve and all of a sudden you have more blood flow going into the nooks and crannies of your muscle that normally wouldn't be there. This alone is going to deliver more glucose into the nooks and crannies and given all the circumstances I've been talking about with the glucose transporters now being more high alert, but now glucose transporters not just on the surface of muscles but deep inside the nooks and crannies of muscles are all coming to the surface soaking up glucose with what they can. We turned on those irrigation valves and it increased this whole process. 
I'm going to get into even more detail with this, but I'm going to cut to the chase too because I really do think that you need to understand this. Irrespective of whatever dietary pattern you're doing, if you are low carb, if you're not low carb, if you are paleo, if you're not paleo, if you're vegan, if you're not, I don't care. It doesn't matter right now. As much as it's a weird time, one of the best times that you can get away with having glucose is during movement, during your workout. This doesn't mean that you always do it. It doesn't. But if you want to be granted the most amnesty to have a Gatorade or granted the most amnesty to like, maybe have some chocolate cake in the middle of a workout, that is literally the best time. Or when you're moving, would it stand in the way of fat loss? Yeah, it would. It would stand in the way of fat loss in that one workout. But if you are trying to find a way to consume carbohydrates and get them sucked into your muscles for muscle glycogen to give you energy for later, do it. I do it. So occasionally, intra workout, occasionally in the middle of my workout, I will sip on 30 grams of carbohydrates. I will do that from time to time. And you know what? My muscles fill up with carbohydrates. I feel full. I feel strong. I might do that once a week, once every two weeks. And it's a huge benefit. And I actually learned this from Dr. Dom Diagostino, who is like world renowned in this stuff at the University of South Florida. Okay, so it's very legit and it's something that I've been applying recently. In terms of carbohydrates that you would want to consume intra workout, and again, it doesn't have to be during a hard workout, just movement in general. Movement alone is going to do things. If you're going, doing Tai Chi in the middle of Central Park, sip on something. But I put a link down below for Thrive Market. They have all kinds of different like intra workout beverages you can drink that have some carbs. They have all kinds of just healthier versions of carbs. But anyway, either way, they're a sponsor on this channel. And if you haven't checked them out, that link will save you 25% off your entire grocery order. Okay, whole grocery order. So that means you go to Thrive Market, you order your groceries for your family. And then since you use that link that's in the description, it's gonna auto apply 25% off your entire grocery order. Plus you get a free gift when you use that link down below. And I think you'll get turned on to shopping through Thrive Market after that because it's changed how I shop. The first couple weeks I was like, this is weird, I missed the grocery store. But here we are like four or five years later of using Thrive Market and I cannot imagine my life without it. My kids certainly can't because I can get foods through Thrive Market that I can never get at the grocery store. So wait, that link is down below in the description. So let's get into how this might work long term because if you turned off this video, then you missed probably the best part, okay? Because what's gonna happen is, in a single bout of exercise, you have that short-term glucose uptake. That's great. But over a longer period of time, you actually get a longer lasting benefit that makes you better at using glucose. It's pretty cool. So when ATP, when that energy currency is depleted, it signals something called AMPK, which I talk about a lot on this channel. AMPK is an energy sensor, and it, it senses when you're low in energy or it senses when you have enough energy, i.e., are you depleted in food and energy or do you have enough available? When you're exercising, obviously, the sensor starts saying, um, okay, we need to attenuate this because clearly it's demanding a lot of energy. So AMPK goes out, it gets activated, phosphorylated, and it says, we need to turn some things on and we need to make sure that these cells use glucose. So not only does it upregulate a protein called AS160, which facilitates glucose into the cell, but it also activates what's called histone deacetylase uh, activation or inhibition in this case. So what that does is it allows GLUT4 to be expressed. What does that mean? What's the difference between GLUT4 translocation and expression? I know I might be losing you here, so I'm gonna circle back and make it really simple. GLUT4 translocation is a single GLUT4 transporter bringing glucose into a single cell, okay? GLUT4 expression is a genetic, at a genetic level, creating more GLUT4 transporters. So now, you don't just have a GLUT4 transporter that's going to the surface and grabbing glucose, now you have dozens of them, or hundreds of them, or however many your body is expressing. So increasing GLUT4 expression through exercise in even a shorter term, like a week, two weeks, three weeks, and I have some studies to reference, can actually make it so that you literally use glucose better. You have more GLUT4 transporters. So it helps you short term during exercise, but it also has a carryover effect long term too. Additionally, the mere contraction of your muscles triggers a change in calcium, an activation that involves calcium. This calcium signaling, this whole pathway, in and of itself, also signals GLUT4 translocation. So you know what the funny thing is? I've laughed about this, but literally flexing your muscles is going to trigger that contraction and that calcium exchange, that calcium transport, 
that is going to allow GLUT4 to translocate. It sounds so cheesy, and I don't expect you to walk around through, you know, Tiananmen Square flexing. You can if you want to, but usually best to go in a bathroom, be by yourself so you don't look like a total freak. Point is, contracting the muscles has a big role. So if you eat some carbohydrates, literally contracting your muscles is not cheesy. It is cheesy, but it works. Let's talk GLUT4 expression for a second, because this is where the science gets really crazy cool. There are studies that show a literal single bout of exercise will elevate GLUT4 mRNA for hours after the workout, meaning you are creating more GLUT4 for hours after that workout. So let's look at a specific body of research. The Journal of Applied Physiology published a study that took a look at 40% VO2 peak, so like 40% maximum power or output, and 80% VO2 peak, maximum power output. So a 40% effort and an 80% effort. And what they found was that the GLUT4 expression, the glucose transporter creation that occurred, was very similar between the intensities. Why is this super cool? Because it tells us that whether you are busting your butt at 80% or just going through the motions at 40%, it's a very similar outcome in terms of how much GLUT4 you actually create and express. This is tremendous news for people that maybe don't have the physical ability to push it super hard. Maybe the joints are rough, maybe you're super overweight, maybe whatever issue that makes it so you can't push it hard. Even a 40% effort of simple movement and exercise will express more GLUT4. Then there was a study published in the journal Diabetes. This one's a weird one, but it's cool. They took subjects and for three weeks they had them do uh, single leg leg extensions. Okay, they probably ended up with some pretty jacked single legs. But what they did is they did a muscle biopsy. Okay, and they found that after three weeks, they ended up having 55% increases in AKT, which we didn't really talk about, and a 25% increase in that AS160 protein that I talked about, the one that's associated with AMPK, and a 52% increase in GLUT4 expression. Now, what ended up happening is 15 hours later, they tested them again, and those GLUT4 expression levels were still elevated 60% above the control group that didn't resistance train. So what we're seeing here is the GLUT4 expression that you get from exercise, specifically resistance exercise, has a long effect. So if you're looking at insulin resistance and you're looking at, well, when do I consume carbs? Well, A, intra-workout is your safest time to have carbs, but also simply working out is gonna make you more sensitive to those so that you suck it up better. It's a win-win. Now, when you're talking about like a lower carb protocol and things like that, you can almost guarantee that if you consume carbohydrates, like 30, 35 grams during your workout, you will probably not get kicked out of ketosis. It's that intense. Now, it's not always the funnest thing to do, right? Okay, so what I typically say is, okay, work out and then maybe have a few carbs post-workout. You have a little bit of that carryover effect and at least that way you didn't squelch the uh, fat burning effect of your workout. But if you really are just in it to have some carbohydrates, Intra-workout carbohydrates fuel you without kicking you out of keto. It's a pretty phenomenal thing. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.